Welcome to our Demand Gen Jam session. I can't believe it, but today is the first episode of season three. Andrea, can you believe we've been doing this for, this will be our third year now? Is that crazy? That is crazy. Unbelievable. So uh, excited for those of you that have been along the ride since uh, day one. You know, our goal really with these Demand Gen Jam sessions is just to deliver some really great information that will help uh, B2B marketers. I love what Dave Gerhardt says on LinkedIn all the time, which is you don't go to college to learn B2B marketing. So all of us kind of have to learn it uh, in the real world. And so we're just trying to use this platform as a way to bring us together and have good conversations around uh, B2B marketing. If if you are not a part of our Demand Gen Jammers community, we have a community on LinkedIn. Uh, it is called the Demand Gen Jammers group. You can see a link to that in the agenda there. Um, go ahead and click that link at some point and you have to request to join. It's a private group. We're trying to keep spammers out of there. So uh, just click and request to join and we will let you in. And then uh, the third bullet down, uh, I almost wish I had a drum so I could do a drum roll, Ryan, but I'm going to do like an air drum roll, just like an air guitar, right? I wanted to introduce you guys to our new SVP of uh, sales and marketing, Ryan Miller, who is going to be delivering uh, the information today, a great presentation on attribution. But more important to that, uh, he's a brand new uh, person on the team, but we've known each other a long, long time. Super excited to have him join us, not only as our SVP of sales and marketing here at Vindy Digital, but he's also going to become our new co-host. So you're going to see Ryan uh, a lot more than today. So you want to say hi to everybody, Ryan? Yeah. Hey, guys. And apologies that you're going to have to see me more. <laughs> it's just one of those things. But um you know, uh, really just happy to be here. And, um, you know, I've known Paul for well over a decade. And it's funny, you know, Ben and I know each other. And um, Paul was one of my first bosses as well. So just a pleasure to be here and, and just love this group. And um, hopefully I can share one or two things of knowledge. If not, you guys all have virtual tomatoes. You can throw them at me as you wish. I didn't know about the virtual tomatoes. Let's not let remind people about those. <laughs> it, just, it just works towards me, Paul. You're, yeah, you're okay, safe. that's fine. As long as they're going towards you, I'm okay with that. So uh, anyways, Ryan, you'll see his face a lot. We're going to try uh, try this format out, but I think it would be great just to have another co-host on the show. And then that doesn't mean that the next person on the agenda is going away. Uh, if you've been watching for a while, you know that Andrea is our moderator, and she does a wonderful job uh, moderating. And uh, Andrea, you want to say hi to everybody yeah hi all um good to see you all here for season three of our demand gen jam sessions um feel free at any time to just drop your questions in the chat and i'll do my best to get those answered for you awesome well why don't we get some chat going ryan you want to walk them through some uh some chat discussions yeah so we would love to hear from you guys we have a couple questions one is you know what tools are you using to measure your your marketing and sales performance today Right. So just drop in whatever tools. And if you've got a stack that's, you know, 50 items long, we'll give you time. You can chat all you need to in there. The other one is, do you take a first touch, a last touch or a multi-touch attribution model if you're at that stage of the game? I prefer the pretzel touch, Ryan. I don't know about you, but you get the in there yeah, one called a pretzel touch. I, I think I think that's the new one that's coming out this year. As long as you put lots of salt on it, it's fine. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Awesome. So you guys just chat that in. It'd be interesting to see what people are doing as it relates to tracking and attribution today. And then just a quick reminder, we do have a Demand Gen Jam session lined up for next month. It's going to be on Valentine's Day, February the 14th. Uh, I think I've got that on there. I do. Uh, Jesse McFarland is going to be our special guest. I love Jesse, uh, somebody that I've met on LinkedIn. Um, the guy really knows uh, what's going on in the world of SEO, as you might. Hey, there's Jesse. I didn't think you were going to be here today, Jesse. Awesome. You want to say hi to everybody? Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> Looking forward to it, Paul. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So next month, Jesse and I are going to be talking about um, what are the B2B SEO ranking factors that really matter. And uh, we were just chatting this morning uh, on LinkedIn about AI and, and SEO. And you know that AI and SEO are a big thing. And and we've got some interesting things I'm looking forward to sharing with you guys uh, next month. And Jesse's just a real uh, master at this stuff. And if you're not following Jesse on LinkedIn, I've got a link there. Check him out. I love the carousels you've been doing recently, Jesse. They're very, very informative and helpful. So uh, check those out. And oh my gosh, Ryan Gibson is in the house. Hey, Ryan, you want to uh, wave and say hi to everybody real quick? Hey, folks. How's it going? 
Yeah, Ryan uh, was a guest last year, and uh, he uh, is one of the best at just doing voice of the customer type interviews and really understanding um, how to get into the mind and speak customer language uh, back to them because that's how you get their attention and really understanding the needs that they have when it comes to the different stages of the buying journey. And Ryan, uh, we haven't picked a date yet, but he's going to be on uh, a future Demand Gen Jam session this year. So glad to have you uh, on the session today. Yeah. So. You, you slid into my DMs the other day, Paul. So I was like, ah, I should come. <laughs> well, awesome. Glad to have you guys. It's kind of like old home week or something. So anyways, uh, please plan on joining us. The, the link to the next month Zoom is right there on the agenda. And so I think we've covered all of our housekeeping items. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about today's topic, uh, which is really all about the art of attribution. And, you know, it's such an important topic when we think about B2B marketing, because, you know, I was kind of joking when I said, you know, I use the pretzel method uh, for the way of tracking attribution, but doesn't it kind of feel like um, we're twisted into a pretzel these days when it comes to trying to figure out, you know, where did this customer come from? Um, what created demand for that customer? What was the tipping point that really made them enter into our sales funnel? Are the sales reps really doing the things they need to do uh, to move them through uh, the journey? And all of that's really complicated. And we're going to unpack some of that with you today and uh, really wanted to tap on Ryan uh, because Ryan's background, and I'm sure he'll get into this a little bit, uh, before joining us here at Vindy Digital was, you know, on on your guy's side of the table. So he's run marketing teams and really understands the challenges that you guys are living and breathing every single day in terms of really understanding what does it take to get somebody that doesn't know that we exist all the way to becoming a customer and what are the tactics and the things that we need to be doing to have that happen more often. And that's really ultimately what uh, good attribution is all about. And so Ryan, I want to pitch it to you just, you know, from your perspective, because you've led marketing teams, what are some of the biggest challenges that are out there just in the world of attribution and tracking and measurement? For sure. So, you know, as Paul mentioned, I've, I've had the opportunity to be on kind of a lot of different sides of the marketing world, but most recently over the past decade, it's working on your side. So it's a brand side, um, also in the consulting side. Um, but one of the greatest challenges that we've always faced was really the the gap between sales expectations and marketing expectations, right? So having the two with pretty different KPIs and different things that are important to them and different things that they have to report on, all kind of coming to the dinner table, kind of fighting, right? Well, we need this and we need this. And then the CEO comes in and says, guys, well, what, what's our pipeline look like? Well, how's marketing doing? And how's our investment doing over here? And what are the things that we need to do? And um, ultimately the data is broken because the teams are kind of broken and how they're thinking about things. So just the kind of lack of, of, of visibility, alignment and understanding each other's role. So if I'm marketing and sales, being able to go like this, Oh, we see you. I see you. And here's what we need so that we can go tell our tech stack, our reporting um, layers, BI, whatever that is, that ultimately gives out a, a unified message. So that's that's the biggest one that I always see. Yeah. You know, Ryan, that makes me think about, um, you know, uh, one of the challenges that we always have is that we, we have, especially in the world of B2B, these fiefdoms, right? So marketing's trying to prove their worth. Sales is trying to prove their worth. And um, there was an interesting post that Chris Walker did on LinkedIn today. I actually shared it in the Demand Gen Jammers group. Um, so be sure to join the group. You can check it out. Um, and that's what he was talking about. It was basically until we fix um, you know, uh, marketing and sales alignment, we're always going to have problems um, with good tracking. And so we have to remember that we're all on the same team and that our focus really should ultimately be towards our corporate objectives. And that's why, in, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges that we have with attribution is we're not connecting the dots between the work that we do in marketing and the work that we do in sales and how those two things working together are driving towards a corporate desired outcome, which is ultimately revenue. And so when you don't have that, what ends up happening is you have people that are driven by fear. I mean, if we really just pull back the curtain, 
in my opinion, it's, you know, I'm afraid of losing my job. So therefore I'm going to create metrics that show that I'm doing my job. And if I'm a marketer, that's going to be getting people to opt in to gated MQL things or things that I can show, Hey, I generated a thousand right fit uh, prospects, but if I'm on sales, then I'm going to try to prove that I'm doing my job. And so if I'm getting leads from marketing and they're not working well, then I'm going to, I'm going to blame it on marketing. And so until we can all work together and go, you know what? The, the goal is more revenue and what can we do and what motions do we need to take so that we can place better bets? Uh, that's really what good attribution is about. And that's, you know, Ryan, one of the biggest challenges I see is I feel like marketers are all been around attribution as a way to prove that their job, that they're doing their job. So they're using attribution to prove that marketing is working. But one of the things I know we're going to be talking about today is that good attribution shouldn't really be about proving that marketing is working, but it should be about improving your business and improving the way that we go to market. And that's really what it's about. And it's not until the whole con uh, company, I almost said country, but the whole company uh, really gets behind, hey, we're trying to grow our revenue here. What are the things and motions we need to do to help us grow revenue? So don't worry about losing your job. We're going to try these things and they're either going to work or not work. And when we find the things that are working, let's do more of that. And when we find the things that aren't working, let's ask ourselves the question, why isn't it working? Because maybe we can fix it or maybe we abandon it. And so when we have that kind of culture, then we can really establish ourselves uh, as a, a unified team, kind of like you were saying, Ryan, and marketing can then support what we're trying to do. Any yep. other challenges that you're that yeah, you can think so of? There's one that's even like kind of at the top of all of this, which is just a bit of paralysis. And if you guys are feeling this, like just know that you're you're completely among friends here, but the paralysis of, well, how do I get there? How do I fix this? How do I get that visibility to be able to like, let's just start with proving it, right? Sometimes you do need to start there, but then how do I get through the journey to improve? So just know that if you're feeling that way, that's totally okay. So a lot of companies and leaders will kind of hit the panic button like, oh, this is too big. It's too hairy. My data is over here and this is over there and all these objectives. Um, it can be really challenging. So just don't worry about that because what we're going to talk about today is how this is an iterative um, kind of program development to get there. Um, the other one, Paul, that's super important is data hygiene. So a lot of times we'll come into an organization and the request is, hey, we need an attribution model, right? We need to be able to tell all the things. Well, that's lovely. How clean is your data, right? And how well are you structuring your data? How are your CRMs set up? How are all of your systems working together? And specifically, what's the accountability and governance on the people who are entering data? I'm going to pick on sales. I've carried a book for a long time. I've been in sales. I love working with sales people. It's some of my favorite things to do. But a lot of times it's just the lack of accountability and governance to enter the data the way that it should be. Because when you do it correctly, you can start to get a good platform of data that you can recall on and you can start to aggregate and build into your attribution model. So those to me, Paul, are really the big three that I see most consistently. Yeah. And I noticed Julia had a comment in there that said, basically, unfortunately, marketing people are the only ones that care about data hygiene. And, and, and that's true. And I know I just, you know, did that whole soapbox on, we all need to come together. We're all one team, but you started picking on sales. So I want to, I want to kind of jump on that bandwagon a little bit. One of the challenges that, that we all have is that we need sales to do a better job of uh, maintaining uh, their hygiene inside of uh, the CRM, right? Because one of the challenges we see all the time, and we'll talk about some of this later on, but, you know, and I know you marketers really live this every day and breathe it every day, but we go and generate a lead, right? Marketing goes and generates a lead um, and then sales follows up on that lead uh, and they find out, oh my gosh, this is a new, this is an opportunity. We can actually sell them something. So what do they do? They go into Salesforce and they create a brand new record with that same contact oftentimes. And all of a sudden we've lost all the attribution of how that person got in there. And we end up with two contact records, one from the marketing side, one from the sales side. And if you don't merge those together well, um, you're gonna lose all of that attribution data in terms of what created demand um, or captured demand. And so it's really important 
um, that you work tightly with sales. And in my, in my opinion, it's always very helpful if you've got an integrated marketing automation platform and CRM platform, those seem to, that kind of helps that play nice together. But then also you just need to work with your sales team and make sure that they understand there's certain things they need to do as they're moving a deal through the process uh, that's going to give us visibility so that we can place better bets in the long run, because ultimately that's what we're trying to do. That all goes back to culture too, though, right? Because if if the sales side isn't involved in the culture is really about growing revenue, not taking credit, it's going to be hard to get those guys to doing uh, the things that we want them to do. But when we all are focused on the same goal of generating revenue, then we can then we can get leadership to help kind of push that down into the into the sales organization. So I picked on sales. I'm going to give you one more on the marketing side. Uh, that I, we see all the time as an agency, and that's marketing teams trying to count all leads the same, right? So if uh, you know I've got my attribution set up, and if I generate a, a gated ebook download and it came from LinkedIn um, or something that happened over or a web webinar registration that came through uh, display or they came through Google search, I'm going to count all those the same. I'm going to look at them all the same. Um, and that's not help, helpful either. Um, there are some leads that are that are more valuable to your organization than others. And you need to be able to have that visibility so that you can not get false positives or even false negatives where you think you're killing it, but you're killing it with great cost per lead because you're generating gated uh, ebook downloads. But those are people that are just interested in learning more. They're really not interested in enter entering your pipeline. So when you can really build some hygiene and rigor around how do I classify my leads so that I can understand what marketing motions are driving the right outcomes, uh, that's a big deal. Um, you know, Ryan, well, I'm going to move us on. It. Yeah, go ahead. Did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, I'm going to slow your train down just a little bit. Um, but one of the the things back to the sales is is the excitement that a sales organization, a sales team will have when you as marketers come into their world to help them understand the value of the extra clicks, the extra steps, right? So a lot of times, especially marketing leadership will come in and say, you need to do this, or they'll go to sales leadership and say, your team needs to do this. It's a finger pointing thing back to what you're saying, Paul, just like it's not an alignment thing. So if you as marketers switch your perspective today about how do you go in and kind of lead in, lead up, lead out to help them understand the value of this. And the value is really at the end of the day, it will save them time and it will make them money. So if you can go into any organization, which is what we all say, oh, we'll save you time, we'll make you money. But if you can go do that to your sales orgs, they're going to love you. Hey, you know, if you take these two or three extra steps, fill out the right, you know, object fields, fields and things like that, here's how. It will actually make your life better. And I've seen it time and time again when they kind of throw stuff at you in the beginning. But then once they go through it a few times, they realize, oh, I, I can see my pipeline. I can see what leads I need to focus on. Oh, hey, marketing, that campaign you did brought me three really good deals. That's where the magic happens. Yeah, that that's a really great point. And, you know, um, one area where I think that to get an initiative like that going, so maybe you don't have a great culture today um, for... Um, getting everybody on the same team, a baby step in that direction to what you just described, Ryan, would be trying to get like an ABM campaign going where maybe you you pick some tier one accounts and you go work them together with sales. And then they can really start seeing some of the motions that you're putting in place. You can put some tracking in place behind it and really see how, you know, you're getting more qualified appointments by working in, in partnership with them um, than working in silos. That's always um, a really good thing to do. Um, you know, Ryan, I'm going to move us on. The, the next topic in our agenda was why do, you know, why does attribution exist in the first place? You know, why do metrics exist in the first place? And I, I know we've covered that a little bit already, but is there anything you want to add to, you know, you know, we all know we track stuff and we can track stuff. And, you know, that's almost, I had a post earlier this week about data confusion. There's so much out there. It's almost overwhelming, but, but why do we track things? What, what are the key reasons why we do these things? Well, you know, most good marketers have like, uh, I would call it just a, a specific data dork inside them, right? It's just something that is innate within a really good marketer is to, because we, because we have it and because we can, we want to, but the other major driving force behind that is, you know, upstairs, right? People who are allocating budgets, driving the direction of the company, whatever that looks like, they're always looking for insights and answers, right? So we are mostly 
reactive marketers to say, okay, uh, here you go. Here's what I found. Here's what we're doing. And, you know, like giving, giving some information. So a lot of it, Paul, frankly, it's a reactive thing and it's a requirement that we have in modern day business. Um, so that's a blessing and a curse, right? But what has happened is, and it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's a fear thing, but it's sort of a mandate thing. And what happens is we all go try to build these systems. We all go try to figure it out. Then what ends up happening is we have band-aids, lipstick, duct tape, WD-40 all over the place trying to put together what it is that we think is attribution and trying to tell the story. We also get really excited that we can do it, right? So there's all of these things, but at the, you know, I have a rule. Anytime we say a business cliche, we've got to take a shot. It's early for some, so we'll do coffee. But at the end of the day, there's your cliche. Um, we're all trying to tell a story. We're all trying to tell a story with numbers and actions and data to say, look, we did this and this is what happened. And this is how we influence our organization's bottom line or lift or whatever we're trying to accomplish. So for me, Paul, it's kind of all over the place. But if you can pull anything out of there, um, it's that we all actually really love telling a good story and we're trying to do our best to do it with numbers. Yeah, you know, the what where my head went when you're walking through that, I totally agree, is that um a lot of the the tracking vendors and martech vendors really haven't done us any favors, right? I think one of the things that they continue to do is come up with shiny new trinkets that give us new visibility into things, which you know, I think creates a lot more. Um, going back to your, we're data nerds on the inside, right? And it's like, oh, I want, I can track that. I need to go figure out what that's all about. And the the reminder that I've got around that is we always need to get back to the fundamentals, right? Um, one of the things that, that we work really hard with our clients on, that we work internally really hard on here at Vindy is to focus on the macro. Um, the macro tells the story of we did these things and we got these outcomes and these outcomes moved us in a good direction or not. Um, and then uh, the micro, you want to have the micro because that's going to help you dig when you discover, oh my gosh, we thought we'd go from A to B. We ended up going to A to A minus. Why did that happen? Let's go dig into the micro then and then try to figure out what happened. And so what ends up happening is people put the micro first and not and then look at the macro second. And what, what you tell a really bad story there. I mean, I, I see it. Uh, all the time with marketing leaders trying to manage up with a micro story when the CEO could care less about all the little speeds and feeds that got you there. They really want to understand how are you helping us achieve the big picture? And so um, the, just a reminder that we can all have analysis paralysis. Uh, there's one of those cliches, right, Ryan? Uh, and and really get under, you know, well, what was the click-through rate on that LinkedIn post? And what was our engagement on that LinkedIn post? At the end of the day, we need to look at this at a much bigger picture because we're trying to place better bets. In, in my opinion, you know, you said we need to manage up, we need to do those things, but, it, and those are true, we also just need to be able to place better bets. That's what tracking is all about, in my opinion. Yeah, so um, the, the tie to improve is everything you know tying everything that we're doing to the improve versus the proof so for everybody on the call today and listening that's one of the biggest themes we want to drive home with you today is get out of the prove it stage and we've got some stuff we'll show you a little later into the improve stage yeah absolutely and a great segue is that's a great segue rather into the next topic which is qualitative versus quantitative metrics and um you know we're big fans of both uh, you know, Ryan Gibson, I, I saw, I can't remember if I, if you and I were having this conversation or I saw you having it with somebody else on LinkedIn earlier this week about what is qualitative metrics versus quantitative metrics and why are they important? We really do believe they're both critically important because one's going to help you um, really uh, see what created that demand for your product or service and created awareness, um, create, started that momentum, if you will. You know, one thing that we say at Vindy Digital all the time is, you know, part of our job at, as marketers is to create awareness and build momentum. And so we want to be able to use qualitative metrics to see what actually created demand. But then we need those quantitative metrics at the end to see what the tipping point was that really got somebody uh, interested in entering our funnel. And so anything you want to add to that, Ryan? No, that's perfect. I mean, it's one of the harder things is what I'll say, but I mean, it's one of the harder things to distinguish and to bring in, but no, that's a really good area to, to dig into. 
Yeah, you know, a couple of things to think about, and I know you're going to cover this in your presentation a little bit, but, you know, people ask about qualitative metrics. How do you do that? Um, I know you've got a screenshot of, of a way to do that. So certainly an easy way to do that would be adding a field on your form that just says, how did you hear about us? And having them type in naturally the words that are in their head, how they hear about you and make that a required field. We get a lot of pushback on that. Like, hey, sh should should it be a drop down box? Do you really want to add it? Should it be a required field? We believe that it should because you get incredible insights on that. And we've got an example in Ryan's presentation we'll show you in a minute. Another is, um, you know, Ryan Gibson, he's going to be doing a session with us later on this year on interviewing customers and getting voice of the customer. That's another great place to get qualitative metrics. Let your customers tell you when you interview them, you know, what, what were those stages that they went through? How did they find out about you? Um, what was it about you that they liked? Those are all great examples of qualitative metrics. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, Ryan, they're harder for sure to get, but they're incredibly uh, valuable and you need to, you really need to measure both. Okay. So the last topic before we get into your presentation is this new term. Um, I don't know if everybody's heard it. It's one that I love called all bound. You know, I think uh, HubSpot is the one that came up with a wonderful term 15, 20 years ago, uh, inbound marketing, and that's different than outbound, what the sales-led organizations were doing for years and years. And now we have this thing uh, called inbound, thanks to HubSpot. But today, we're starting to hear this concept that I absolutely love, and I know you do too, Ryan, which is all bound. Tell us about that. So yeah, the other distinguishing point about the bound is the outbound, right? So outbound has been what's and then that's that's been around since the invention of the wheel, right? You're either peddling in the streets your newspaper or you're using complex marketing systems to outreach to your targets. You've got salespeople who are outbounding to try to generate, you know, interest. And then you've got inbound people who are raising their hands, coming to you and saying, yep, I'm interested in what you're saying. I need to learn more. So all bound is a combination of all of it. And that's really the biggest segue into attribution. Because we're trying to look at all of it. And as marketers, we have to be really smart to be able to look at all of that stuff. Because outbound activities, which typically are held in the sales house, super important for us to be looking at. Inbound typically is held in the marketing world, super important for sales to be looking at. Right. So now you have all bound, which is this beautiful combination of all of it that us as modern day marketers need to have a really good hold of. Yeah, absolutely. Because when we think about all of this, what we haven't really touched on yet today is buyer behavior, right? We're trying to get buyers, people that are qualified to buy the products and services that we sell to come to us and buy things from us. And what's happening is their behavior has changed dramatically over the last five years, over the last 15 years. And we have to serve them well. And all bound really is the best way to do that because what we're discovering, especially in this post COVID era is that buyers are self-educating more than ever. In fact, the last study that I saw, it takes 31 touches uh, to get a buyer from not knowing that you exist to wanting to talk to sales. They want to look at over 11 pieces of information today and they're pushing talking to sales until the very last possible minute. Uh, and then you've heard me, if you've been on this, uh, watched any of these shows before, I talk about this almost every other time, but this Harvard Business Review study that came out uh, end of uh, 2022, where they went and surveyed over a thousand B2B buyers and discovered that before that buyer prioritized a, a, a pro product problem to solve, sorry, easy for me to say, uh, and said, we're going to work on this. We're going to solve this problem. We're going to go find a solution to solve this problem. Before they prioritized it, they had four to five vendors in mind that they thought would be the right vendor that could solve for them that problem. And then fast forward to the end of the journey when they actually made the decision to go with a particular vendor, that they went with one of those four to five vendors 90% of the time, which that blows the whole sales led model out of the water today. Because what that's saying is if you're not on their radar before they become a, what we call a now buyer, you've got a one in 10 chance of winning that business. And so all bound is a way of solving for that. And it kind of goes back to a big theme we've had this whole session, which is we have to shift our culture because we've got to work with buyers the way they want to work with us. And we've got to serve them well through that journey and make it super easy for them to get to the information that they need. Even if that means taking like your demo that's been 
you know, held behind, you know, you've got to schedule a demo with a sales rep and you've got to talk to a sales rep to have that demo. Maybe you should go look at that demo and what's communicated in that demo and turn that into content and make that content readily available um, and get it out there to serve your buyers before they're ready to talk to sales. Cause we know that they're pushing that off till the very last minute. The reason I bring that up, Ryan, is that, oh my gosh, what does that do with tracking? Because now we need to know, you know, what articles did they look at? What information was important? How do we understand what really moves the needle? And I think that's a great segue into what you're going to be sharing with us today. 100%. And I'll drop in the other couple nuggets too. So even like 15 years ago, your 31 number of touches was like 10, mm -hmm. right? I saw it pop up in the comments, but from the LinkedIn B2B Institute, you know, just know that 95% of our buyers are not in market today. They're yeah. just not, right? So our ability to walk alongside them and be supportive and evaluate a journey is our new job, right? Right. That's that's it. So it, that's a really difficult thing for some people to grab a hold to, especially if you're a sales led organization. It's just not that way anymore. And 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 prospects are avoiding talking to sales like the plague. They're over it. They're done with it. They don't want it. So to your point, Paul, like, yeah, they're going to do all the homework possible so that when they come to the table, they know what's up. They've already checked you out. They've done their homework and they're going to ask you a few specific questions and then they're in and they're out. Right. Yep. And so many sales leaders today are having a hard time getting their head around that because they still believe, oh, I can solve my revenue problem by adding more salespeople to the organization. And really, that's a that's a loss leader situation because it's a zero sum type game where you have to get in front of them before they're in market if you're going to win the business today. That's what smart marketers are doing. And that's why attribution is so important. And um, what I'm going to do now is actually share my screen. Uh, I had a couple of things I wanted to share with you, or one, I guess one thing I wanted to share with you before we got into Ryan's presentation. And that is we, um, Ryan just wrote a great blog on uh, the 10 biggest B2B attribution links um, that you need to be watchful for. We could have spent two hours on this one blog. So what we thought we would do is just highlight it. We've actually got it linked off uh, in the agenda at the very bottom in the resource section. Um, can you guys see my screen? Thumbs up, Ryan, if you can see my screen. Okay, great. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I would highly encourage you guys to check it out. Ryan's identified the top 10 reasons um, that you might have an attribution issue. And then the thing I loved about it is he doesn't leave you hanging and say, oh, you know, number one is department centric reporting uh, distorts the full buyer journey. He's got a fix in there for each one of them. So go check that out. Um, again, we could spend two hours on that. We didn't want to do that today. So um, check out that uh, the blog. If you've got any questions on it, jump on the Demand Gen Jammers community. Uh, we can answer those questions or just reach out to us. We're happy to do that. Okay. So Ryan, if you're ready, I'm ready. I'm going to I'm gonna get this in presentation mode here. And uh, I'll be Vanna for you. And uh, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. And uh, we will go from there. Super. Let's do it. All right. Boom. First of all. Everybody, you might be feeling like this. I talked about it earlier, right? But sometimes the data and marketing attribution and data and all these wonderful things that we're all trying to figure out is a lot like herding cats, right? Now, I firmly believe that most of you are cowboys and cowgirls, right? You've got all the skills and all the things and the look to be able to go do this. But, um, you know, cats, that they don't listen, they don't behave, they do whatever they want, and they make you kind of come to them. And I sometimes think that data attribution and building all this is very similar, <laughs> <laughs> so if you feel the same, give me a thumbs up for cats. Uh, next. <laughs> so we talked a little bit about, um, you know, there's 31 touches and there's this and there's that. And like, why is this so dang hard? Why is it um, that we're going out and looking at all these tools? And, you know, Paul, you mentioned it earlier, but like, you know, new tool, new shiny object. Um, why are we um, even having this talk today? Right. It's because the old journey was just that the old journey was pretty straightforward. Right. Really, even pre Internet is what this is kind of really even coming into or, or, or alluding to is if you are a company, you, you made a product, you sold the product and service or whatever it was, and people knew about you through, you know, various ways, but mostly word of mouth. Um, they would hear that, oh, that person sells a wheel. I need the wheel. They'd go to the wheel person who makes that wheel and they would buy it. They would buy whatever services you need your house painted, you need whatever. It was pretty straightforward. 
But now um, the new journey, which you guys might um, be able to associate with, it's the pretzel, right? It's a complete yep. F show, if you will, right? There's stuff all over the place. So what I want you guys to constantly think about as you, you know, leave this call and go on with your day is I want you to be thinking uh, poor buyers, meaning have empathy for these buyers who are trying to buy point. Have empathy because these poor people are trying to make decisions that are really important, right? In B2B world, it's typically a higher price item. It typically takes a long time to make the decision because they don't want to screw it up. They do not want to make a mistake by hiring the wrong marketing agency or they're buying the wrong boiler for their industrial building, whatever that may be. So this is the path that they're now going through, right? And it's a mess. So no wonder it's hard to track all this stuff. You know, uh, real quick, the when you were going through that, it was making me think about assembly line. Like uh, so many times we think about marketing is like an assembly line, but it really isn't like an assembly line because the buyer really is in way more control than we realize or that we want to admit today. And so, you know, a key part is understanding what those different stages of their journey are because they're going to move in and out and look way more like a pretzel, right? And uh, and then making sure that we're serving them well in each of those stages of their journey. What what do they need at each stage and how do we make that available to them? And then how do we use attribution to really figure out, um, you know, is that true or not? We make an assumption, we try something out. Did it work or did it not work? That's what attribution needs to help us do. Yeah, and real quick, go back, Paul, real yeah. quick. So the, the whatever you want to call this, the squiggly line of doom, Again, poor buyers, man, we feel so bad for them, but we've created this marketers. This is our mess. <laughs> we did this, but there's reason for it. Now, good B2B marketers will, you know, do everything they can to be easy to consume, be easy to buy from and things like that. But attribution does need to track all this. Okay. So keep that in mind. So let's go to the next one. So what happens when we don't, and I talked a little bit about this and I'm pretty passionate about the, the, the building the bridge between sales and marketing. But here's some of the stuff that I've specifically heard, and I'll read these quickly. If you relate, you know, again, throw in a hand there, but senior leadership, right? So they're going through all this stuff. Um, we're not going to increase the marketing budget. We're going to hire more salespeople because we see that they are taking action. I just came out of an experience about a year ago with a $400 million company that manufactures things. They said this. They literally fired the majority of their B2B arm when like 95% of their business is selling to other businesses. They got rid of it. And they, they literally went and hired like 15 more salespeople. Did not work out for them. But this is a very specific thing. They can see the action. They can track it. They can really put their hands around. Oh, yep, I see that they're working. So this must be good. So sales. Marketing hasn't done anything to help us drive leads. The only the only leads that we have are self-generated. So we talked about that earlier, right? The, I did this, this is mine, you didn't do that. I'm gonna keep my job, don't care about you. Marketing, hey, we generated dozens of great leads this month and sales haven't closed any of them. How many times have you guys heard that, right? That is the thing that keeps me up at night. It's like, oh my goodness, we did this phenomenal campaign. We drove 125 leads from the blah, blah, blah. You go into your CRM and you look and they haven't been touched, right? So next slide. Okay, guess what? We get ourselves into one of these things, right? And I, it, it stinks that it still happens today. And I have seen sales and marketing leaders have absolute blowouts over this stuff. So we're here today to advocate for the... Um, the coming together of this through attribution, through data, through expectations and understanding. So we we don't want to see this anymore. You That's know, all. Ryan, one of the things I'm just going to touch on this because we we've hit on the theme a couple of times today. But um, you know, when we treat all of our leads the same and we don't prioritize or or the leads that are highly qualified because we can't see them because we have bad attribution, that's a huge thing that leads to this, right? When we can understand what are the most qualified leads and what can we do to get more qualified leads in the funnel, and then let's prioritize those that we're handing off to sales rather than lumping a thousand leads into one bucket with 10 of them being amazing and, you know, 990 of them being crap. That's when we end up in this place and we we're there because we can't tell if we don't have right. good attribution, we can't tell. Right. And that's where also there's a lot of pressure that comes down from the top. It's like, what are you guys doing? And I don't know if you guys have been through this too, but mid-year budget cuts because you as marketers are not hitting your numbers. 
that's a problem. And I bet in most of those situations, you will not need to take those budget cuts if you could prove it better. So what can we do about it? That's a great question. It's always the hardest part, right? Okay, so this is another one of those slides, Paul and I could spend three hours on and you guys could as well. But ultimately, this is the phases of marketing analytics maturity. So this is a combination of kind of how to think about marketing attribution, again, as an iterative process of building. It's, it's not something that just happens all at once. It is not, you know, you don't build a house just presto, right? You've got to start with the foundation, then you got to build walls, and you got to do all the things. So that's what this is. So if you look at the left, we've got kind of business values. At the bottom, we've got some thinking. And then in the middle, as we're going through our kind of positive trend line, where we're heading. So the bottom, let's start at the bottom. So the first kind of bucket is the executives need proof marketing is working. That's where a lot of us may be today, right? It's where a lot of, you know, kind of, um, you know, I would say in their infancy or even in our maturity, we're kind of like always trying to prove it. Hey, look what we did. Hey, look what this did. So in the next stage in, in your evolutionary growth, it's you new know, executives have the proof. So now, boom, you're on it. You've got some systems and processes that are working. Your data is getting pretty good. Now you can say with confidence, here's what's going on. Then towards the kind of the, the final sort of graduation stage is you're now a trusted partner within the organization. Because I don't know about you guys, but all too often as a marketer, you kind of feel like the redheaded steptile sometimes. It's like, man, yeah, marketing, we don't really need them. I don't really get it. We kind of have to have it. Um, sometimes even uh, I know some marketing executives who don't even have a seat at the table, you know, the big executive table anymore because they just don't see the value. And that has unfortunately become a, a theme over the past few decades. Um, so now when we get there, we're the kind of seen again as that strategic partner. So I'll pause there, Paul, any, any ads yeah, so far? A couple of things. Uh, first of all, I forgot to sh share this as we were moving into the presentation portion of the uh, the session today. Um, the slides are in the agenda. So if you go down to the agenda, um, you'll see about halfway down, you can click and get these slides. Um, a, a promise that we'll always have to you at Vindy Digital, anything that we share with you, these resources are free to use for you. So if you want to screenshot this and go show it to your boss, that's 100% okay with us. Um, and then the the thing that I would just really love to just put an exclamation point on related to this information is uh, the big takeaway for me is that attribution isn't a moment in time. It isn't a thing, a box that we check and say that we're done. It really is a progression. And when you know Ryan showed this to me a few months ago, I I even had an aha moment because. When we hear people talk about, I need to improve my tracking, or I want better reporting, or I need um, my attribution to do this or that, um, there's so many different ways that, and layers to what attribution really is. And so when we think about some of the topics we've covered today, you know, in conversations that I have with B2B marketers day in and day out, I really do believe most people, Ryan, are in that first stage that they are trying to prove marketing is actually worth it, right? And to your point, um, the last time I saw this data, which is a couple of years old now, that the CMO is the fastest turning seat in the C-suite, right? And it's because they never get to that far right side. And so as marketers that are watching uh, the session today or part of the session today, my encouragement to you would be to look at this and, and ask yourself the question, how do we get from the left side to the right side? And, you know, even with some, some of the advent of AI and data analytics that we can get with AI, I think we're going to be able to get to that right side even faster uh, in fact, I think in two months, maybe three months, we're, we're going to bring in uh, the Jasper people and we'll be talking about predictive analytics and how to use AI to do that. But I think all of us, if we want to uh, have job security, we need to learn how to get from the left side to the right side. 100%. So your path to CMO, if you're not already there from a data perspective, and that's how you're going to win, is ultimately be able to speak finance and speaking data. Right. So this is one of those huge paths to get there. And I would say, yeah, Paul, like the majority of the people that I work with and we work with and are kind of in this orange bucket. Right. So the nice thing about this slide, too, sorry for the jets, if you can hear. Them. But the nice thing about this, you can go in and identify for yourself. Where are you? Right. And that's OK. It doesn't matter wherever you are. You are. But you can go and pick. OK, I'm at ad hoc. OK, that's great. 
got a lot of room for improvement and here's a path. But ultimately, and you probably know some people, maybe you're here too, but using a lot of Excel, right? That's a big flag right there. Um, I do work with companies today um, who have a lot of their stuff in an Excel spreadsheet, right? So moving up, right? So we're getting into descriptive. So a little bit more focus, a little bit more um, intelligence, a little bit more thinking around campaigns and things like that. So I'm not going to go through them all, uh, but ultimately this is a great kind of step for you to go, okay, man, I'm, I'm a descriptive. Now, how do I get to informative? What are the steps that I need to do? And those are things we can totally help you with and unpack and just kind of have a conversation about um, to kind of help you get there. But this is what we have found to be a very successful roadmap for ourselves and for the companies that we're talking to and our clients that we work with to just A, take a deep breath because Paul, you said it really well. Like it's not just going to happen overnight. It's it's like golf, right? You can always get better. You never win. Um, but ultimately, if you can make inc incremental improvements um, and work towards prescriptive, right? Not easy to do, but it's again, something that if you take some steps over time, you'll get there. Yeah. And I can't emphasize enough, you know, Ryan, when he put this together a few months ago and shared it with me, it was such an aha moment because it, it unlocked where I feel like so many B2B marketers struggle with even communicating about metrics and attribution. So please use this, understand it, get it, let, ask us questions if you have questions about it. I think it will help you even have good internal communication uh, with your own team, with leadership, with sales on really what do we mean when we say tracking? What do we mean when we say reporting? Yay. Right. So now you've got some tools and like there are these moments, right? This kid just speaks to me every single time. There are these moments when you connect the dots, even if it's a simple thing, like maybe um, within your CRM, you've added and we'll talk about this in the next couple of slides here. But maybe you've added um, a key field in your form that says, how did you hear about us? Now, this is old, old news, right? It's been around forever, but then it got dropped off. And then it got butchered by people putting in, literally, I've seen this, 15 different things. How did you hear about us? Well, again, poor user, poor prospect. How are they supposed to remember? Like, I, I know a lot of us probably don't watch regular TV anymore. But if I was to ask you guys, if you're watching TV or even the radio, what was the last commercial that you heard? 99% of you have no clue. And I'm the same, right? So for me, it's connecting maybe one small thing. So maybe you're putting this little, um, how did you hear about us on your form? And then all of a sudden you get an answer, you get a reply. Now you have insight. Now you get to be like this kid and go like, holy crap, this is amazing. I actually learned something about this particular prospect's journey that I didn't know. So get excited. Next slide. Okay. So there are actually way more than six types of marketing attribution models, but these are ones that are pretty commonly used. So last touch, first touch, linear attribution, position-based attributions, time decay attribution, and algorithmic attribution, right? Yeah. Wow, overwhelming, lots of stuff. Paul, go ahead. Yeah, where's the, where's the pretzel? <laughs> I didn't see pretzel attribution in there, but I think it's implied, right? Uh, yeah, maybe it's algorithmic. So there's a lot to consider. So we just wanted to make it very simple for you today. Don't worry about all that. Focus on first and last touch, first touch, where people first kind of meet you, meet the brand, have that exposure. Last touch, where do people feel confident to opt in, whether that's to opt into an email campaign or whether that's to opt into calling or, you know, contacting you guys from a sales perspective. Great point, Ryan. You know, one thing uh, that I just want to touch on there is we marketers love to get ourselves bent around the axle, bent into a pretzel. And if we want to get better at attribution, really the key point was start here. Can you do a good job of tracking what created the demand for your business? Can you do a good job of tracking what the tipping point was? If you can start there, then don't worry about all the other stuff. Let that become more of that maturity model like Ryan was talking about. So when you see, and you can keep this slide, but when you see first touch and last touch, again, it's as far as improving marketing, if you're seeing certain trends within the first touch, do more of that. If you're seeing things not working, do less of that. And then the last touch, when they've kind of tipped over, again, do more, do less. You can see what's actually happening, right? So uh, self-reported self attribution, we've talked about it a few times because it's really fascinating. But again, like ask them, how did you hear about us? Um, the other thing is software attribution. This is where we're all heading. And it's getting really exciting, right? The, the technology is a little bit less shiny object and squirrels and all the stuff over here. 
and more practical and applicable to what we're up to. Yeah. So that's yep, being able to go into all the various tracking mechanisms to give you guys real insights. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to say here on this slide, Ryan, is GA4 isn't going to cut it, right? We cannot yeah. use Google Analytics as the way of tracking the success of our efforts anymore. Uh, Google Analytics is only going to track the activity that happens on our website. And so much of that buyer journey doesn't happen on our websites today. Plus with the deprecation of cookies and things like that, we really have to have something more sophisticated than GA4. And I'm not here poo-pooing GA4 and saying we don't need it. We absolutely do. But the the key point is we can't think of that as our one version of the truth and, un, and expect to get all of the answers out of Google Analytics. Paul, 100%. It's a, it's a portion of the whole thing. Okay, right. So here's an example Paul and I have talked about a few times, but literally on our form, right? Schedule a chat with us. Somebody came through, fill it up. Oh, how'd you hear about us? Again, it's wide open. We do not lead the witness at all. And somebody said, hey, I heard you on a podcast. How freaking cool is that, right? To be able to someone remembered over time. Yeah, I heard him on a podcast. So guess what? Podcasts? Yeah, we're going to do more guest appearances on podcasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got an interesting lead the other day, Ryan, where uh, same deal. They filled out a form and they just, we asked them where they heard about us. And they said, I've watched all your videos on YouTube. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty interesting. So, you know, is YouTube important? Probably um, based on that type of uh, insights. So you're, you're just not going to get all that. Um, oh, you know what? That's a really good point, Ryan. I'll just touch on that real quick. Both of those came in as direct. If you went into Google Analytics and, and said, not. where did that lead come from? They both showed up as they went to vindydigital.com. They filled out a form. So again, Google Analytics isn't giving us the real answer. Uh, we didn't really learn you know, what created demand for us, uh, but by asking the question, we did. So happy attributing. Thanks, wow. I, you know, Ryan, I was a little worried about us getting all the way through this content before uh, one o'clock. So uh, the top of the hour, at least one o'clock for me here in the central time zone. So I uh, kudos to you for doing a great job uh, and getting through this information. Very insightful. Um, I've been doing digital marketing for 24 years now. And, uh, you know, man, marketing and attribution has been an Achilles heel for, since day one. And so I really do feel like some of the thinking that you've done around this really is kind of pointing in a direction that starts to make this stuff make more sense so that we can place better bets. Uh, Andrea, we've got like five minutes here before we need to wrap. Uh, any interesting themes or high level questions that you can source? It looks like we've had like 90 chats here if I'm looking at this right. So uh, kudos to everybody for having a great little chat stream as we go through there, but any interesting observations or comments that you'd like to make? Um, I do have one question that came up in the chat. Um, and if Gary Wick is still on here, if you want to unmute yourself and ask it, you can do that. I don't know if he's still on here. Yeah, no, I, I'm actually still on I, So Ryan, it, it's a pleasure to meet you. I actually sent you an email back uh, a little while ago. But one of the things that I was curious and I'd like to get your perspective on is around going through channel. So, you know, we lose a lot of visibility and have a lot of challenges when you do have channel partners, distributors, et cetera. So is there any kind of perspective or best practices that you have on how to navigate kind of that flow? And then also from an attribution model, you know, how can we go improve that we're adding value into the channel and what's working, you know, when they are offering marketing programs, et cetera? Great question. So um, channel's tough, right? Because you have that fracture between ownership, <laughs> right? And really when you're working with channel, they have their own business, they have their own models, they have a lot of times their own CRMs, like it, it is a huge problem. So one thing that's similar that like really HubSpot kind of built the model on this, but is shared pipelines. The challenge with that, of course, is that the other your channel partners need to have the same, you know, tech stack or some sort of integration with that, or you maybe you bring them in as a user, but they don't always like that. Um, but that can be an incredible way, right? And then of course, from there you would train on how to use it, how to enter deals, or if you're assigning deals for that, can be really amazing. And something I encourage any kind of channel leader to go see if they can implement and build that. But the other thing is really back to like kind of the how did you hear about us? It's the personal side of thing. It's the well, what it's kind of anecdotal, which can be a slippery slope, but is to ask the question like, hey, how did this go? Where did that, you know, what, what did you attribute to this? You know, what are the things that you're seeing on your side? So it's also a communication thing. 
Um, but ultimately, um, that's a that's a really tough one. And I've worked with a lot of different channels. And I can't say that we have the answers yet, just because they're typically two very different organizations. Yeah, and I hate to use the the phrase it depends, but it's some it's so many ways it does depend on the 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 sales motion. So if you're working with a channel and you're working with a partner. Um, it, it, you know, it depends on how much sales involvement are you going to have? Are they bringing the deal all the way to the table? Um, and you're just getting the revenue, you know, a lot of that will come into play on what are the right, uh, tools and tactics. Um, I will tell you that there's some new, very cool, uh, marketing tech that's coming out. In fact, I, I don't remember the name of it. I will certainly, um, uh, send this out to you, Gary, if you're interested or put it in the demand gen jam session, but we just became a Jasper partner. And mm -hmm. one of the things that Jasper was telling us about was a tool where we can both log into the tool and it goes in and, and we don't have to be on the same CRMs to do this. It'll go in and mine, um, our CRM and mine their CRM and bring all of the deals, like the contact records mm -hmm. that are together together. So if there's somebody that's in our contact record that all, they also have a contact record of, then it brings all that together um, and gives you the ability to then say, hey, you're working these deals, we're working these deals. And then now that attribution, and, and I'm not, they, they didn't tell us this from an attribution perspective. I'm connecting a couple of dots here. But once you understand, oh my gosh, we've got these deals and you've got these deals that are the same, we can then start looking at where did that demand come from and, uh, and, and start trying to add some attribution that way. I saw a question come up in the chat. Does Jasper do that? No, they don't. It's a third party software that they, and I can't remember the name of it, but they, they want, they encouraged us to go get it so that they could go um, mine through our CRM list so that we could come up with a um, combined uh, target account list. So anyways, the other, the other part is we work with channel two. And so we've got uh, a system set up inside of our CRM so that when people come in, we flag them as a channel lead. And then, you know, we're able to it's more manual than I'd like it to be, but we're able to update where did those, where did that lead come from? Um, you know, did they come to a webinar? Was it a co-marketing thing? And so we're just really trying to provide good rigor on the data hygiene side of things so that we, when it finally does make it over uh, to the tipping point, that at least, at least we have some insights into where it came from. Hopefully that helps Gary. Yeah, no, I, and I would love to to learn a little bit more about that Jasper piece that you mentioned. So anything that you could share with that, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I'll, uh, I've got it in my notes, so I'll find it. And I'll, uh, Gary, I'll just shoot you an email or DM you. I'll also put it out there in sure. the in the Demand Gen Jammers group. Um, I'm looking at the time. We're at two minutes till. So unless you've got something really short, Andrea, I I think we should probably just take those questions over to the uh, Demand Gen Jammers group. Um, so, you know, one thing Ryan and I will always do is just go through the chat logs afterwards. So if there's anything that we didn't get covered today, we'll make sure that we'll bring that up as discussions uh, in the Jammers group. Uh, remember, next month, we're going to be talking about everything B2B SEO. Uh, super excited for Jesse to be in the house and walk us through that. So uh, please join us for that. And then until next time, guys, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate y'all being here. And uh, let's stay connected in the Demand Gen Jammers group. You guys have a great day.